Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar, TOPS. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Justin White, a tobacco control researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. TOPS is being organized by myself, Catherine McLean at Temple University, Mike Pesco at Georgia State University, and Si Shang at The Ohio State University. The seminar will be one hour with questions asked by the moderator and discussant. The audience may pose questions and comments in the Q&A panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the, the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments meeting seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. The presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I'll turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Catherine McLean at Temple University to introduce our speaker. Today, Dr. Julia Dennett will lead a traditional paper presentation entitled, The Long Run Impacts of Cigarette Taxes on Smoking. Dr. Bennett is a health economist and a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Epidemiology of Micro Microbial uh, Diseases at the, the Yale School of Public Health. Her research examines the determinants of health with a particular emphasis on health policy, substance use, and infectious disease. In addition to her work evaluating the long-term effects of cigarette taxes on smoking, Dr. Bennett's current pro projects include the efforts to evaluate the impacts of harm reduction initiatives and Medicaid expansion on the health of people with opioid use disorder. She received her PhD in health policy, economics concentration from Harvard University, and a BS in economics from MIT. Our discussant today is Mike Pesco of Georgia State University. Dr. Dennett will be presenting her research in two segments. We will have a pause after each segment to allow for questions. Dr. Dennett, thank you for presenting for us today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to uh, be presenting today. Um, so can uh, everybody see my slides? Perfect, excellent. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you again for having me. Um, in particular, thanks to Mike Pesco and Catherine McLean. Um, I am presenting um, some work today that looks at the long run impacts of cigarette taxes on smoking. Um, and so I'm currently in the process of revising the working paper for this draft. Um, and so I'm very excited to hear any uh, specific comments or suggestions um, at this stage in the research. So uh, just to uh, discuss my disclosures. Um, so the funding for this research was supported by the National Institute on Aging, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the National Science Foundation, um, a dissertation completion fellowship, and um, the content is solely my responsibility. Um, uh, it, uh, I have never received industry funding and have no conflicts of interest to declare. So uh, just to preview uh, this discussion for today, um, First, I'll go over the motivation and uh, my research question, which is how does life course cigarette tax policy affect long-term adult smoking behaviors in the United States? The data I'll be using um, is the smoking behaviors of respondents aged 18 to 64 from pooled 1984 to 2010 behavioral uh, risk factor surveillance system data uh, linked to state cigarette excise taxes. And so the final analytic sample here um, is actually uh, represented 25 pooled years of adults over six decades of birth cohorts. So it's a very large data set. My empirical strategy is going to be um, a variation of a two-way fixed effects strategy that exploits current and historical variation in cigarette taxes within states. And so just to preview uh, my results, I find that cigarette taxes over the life course uh, prevent uh, people from uh, starting to smoke, smoking initiation. It causes adults who smoke to reduce the smoking intensity in the short run, and over the long run um, actually leads to quitting. And so I'll also, um, after the results, describe a series of robustness tests that I've either undertaken or am considering undertaken taking um, to look at the validity of my findings. And then finally, um, as a policy exercise, um, I use my results to estimate the long-term impacts of a modern tax hike. Um, so this is a large tax hike of a roughly $1.25. Um, and I find that this translates into 40 to 70,000 fewer deaths from smoking-related causes over the next 20 years. 
So first, uh, just to describe background and motivation for the study, um, I think don't need to go too much detail for this audience, but uh, so cigarettes are the main cause of preventable mortality in the US. They are responsible for almost half a million deaths each year, including deaths from lung, uh, lung cancer, other cancers, heart disease, uh, respiratory conditions. And uh, this is due to the cumulative exposure um, to chemicals in cigarette tax folk. And uh, many policies have been implemented to prevent or re reduce tobacco use. Um, and so today we're gonna focus on state cigarette excise taxes. And currently uh, the literature has found that cigarette tax hikes appear to have a limited impact on current smoking behaviors. However, um, the effects of these tax hikes may actually take some time to develop. Um, so we'll be looking at whether or not the effects of tax hikes develop over the long run. Um, and whether or not it just takes time for smoking behaviors to adjust in response to tax hikes. So previous research on the long run effects of cigarette tax hikes um, tend to focus on the teenage years. Um, and so this makes sense uh, since the goal of uh, is often to prevent initiation in the first place. And 90% of adults who started smoking uh, reported that they start, reported starting smoking uh, by the age of 18. And so this literature finds that teenage tax hikes do indeed decrease later adult smoking. However, um, a currently unexplored area is uh, the effects of long-term cigarette tax hikes that occurred during adulthood. So on the one hand, uh, exposure to tax increases may limit long-term smoking. However, uh, on the other hand, tax hikes may actually fail to alter the established smoking behaviors of adults who smoke. Uh, which suggests the need for alternative interventions to reduce smoking. And so this analysis is going to examine the impacts of life course cigarette tax policies on long-term adult smoking in the US. And so this is going to look at both the uh, tax hikes that occur during the teenage years and tax hikes that occur throughout adulthood. So to discuss the data, um, so the first thing I did was construct a timeline of cigarette tax, uh, cigarette taxes from 1950 to 2011. And this is represented as tax per pack of cigarettes um, in real uh, 1982 dollars. And so I find that um, you could see it in this graph is this blue line. Um, so this I find that the real cigarette tax fluctuates over time. Um, beginning in about 1950, um, it rises through the early 70s. Um, and then it falls through 1980 and then starts to slowly increase again um, and then dramatically grows after 2000. So this is the variation um, I'll be using in the analysis. Um, so I also include um, some other controls of other policies that were implemented in this time period. So um, the first is 100% uh, smoke-free laws, uh, which prevent smoking um, in certain public settings, so workplaces, restaurants, and bars. And I also include uh, compliance with SINAR regulations, uh, which, uh, prohibit which prohibited tobacco sales to children. And then, so the, the uh, effects of these were the compliance uh, with SINAR regulation was assessed by us through surprise insp inspections. Um, and both of these uh, policies were implemented in roughly the mid 1990s. And you can see from the graph that they uh, were implemented very quickly after they were introduced. So next, moving on to the analytic sample. Um, so I'm gonna be looking at respondents from Pooled's annual 1984 to 2010 behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. Um, and the outcomes, I'm gonna focus on three outcomes. So the first two um, are extensive margin outcomes, and then the third is an intensive margin outcome. So the first is reporting ever having smoked, uh, which is an indicator for having smoked 100 cigarettes over your life. The second is an indicator for current smoking. So this represents smoking participation. And the third uh, represents smoking intensity, which is the, uh, which I define here as the average number of cigarettes consumed each day, conditional on current smoking. And just a note that this, uh, this, uh, that this uh, outcome is only available for um, uh, it's, it's available for a shorter time period compared to the fuller the full sample so it's only available from 1984 to 2000 so just to note it's a slightly different analytic sample um, than the other outcomes and so what i do uh, is i la link uh, state cigarette excise taxes uh, to these respondents first by the current state and the current year 
and then by the current state and the past year at specific ages. So as a result, uh, what I end up with is that each respondent in the sample is matched to their current and past cig cigarette taxes of their state. Um, and so the eight specific past ages I look at are 17, 30, 40, and 50 years old. Um, however, um, there's an assumption that goes into this, which is that I assume the current state of residence is also the past state of residence. Um, and I need to do this because the state of past residence is not available um, in my data set. And so I'll discuss the implications of this um, in, uh, as part of the robustness tests a bit further um, after I present the results. So uh, to discuss my empirical strategy, um, I use a version of a two-way fixed effect model. So it's going to exploit within state variation in cigarette taxes. So specifically, it's a linear regression um, specification that's focusing on approximate decade interval subgroups um, for adults aged 18 to 64. And so uh, Y represents the smoking outcome for individual I living in state S with year of birth B in the current year Y and current month M. This current policy um, variable rip is a matrix of current tobacco policies, which includes the cigarette tax. Um, it also includes 100% smoke-free laws and the SINAR compliance rate. And then this EL tax represents the earlier life cigarette tax um, at a past age. And so what, what past age is included in the regression, you'll see on the, in the results section, but it corresponds to what decade interval subgroup um, I'm looking at specifically. And so I also include some uh, other controls and fixed effects. So uh, first I control for time varying state level economic factors. And I do this using the current state uh, GDP. And so that's that GSP variable in the equation. Um, I also include uh, a mix, uh, matrix of individual demographic characteristics, age, sex, race, ethnicity. Um, I also include next state fixed effects. And so these can account for time invariant state factors. Um, and this allows me to identify impacts uh, within state, uh, identify impacts using within state policy variation. And so I'd be comparing the outcomes of adults uh, who are differentially exposed to tax changes within states at different ages. I also include birth year fixed effects uh, to account for national time specific factors that occur for each, each single year of birth cohorts. And then I also include month, current month and current year fixed effects to account for national time specific shocks. Um, and then uh, all regressions are weighted using the survey weight and standard errors are clustered by state. And so what, these co the, what, what this uh, formula gives us, what this model gives us, um, the coefficients of interest are beta one and beta two, and they uh, are going to capture the effects of current and past state cigarette tax hikes on adult smoking outcomes controlling for other state tobacco policies. And so just to be very clear here about what the identifying assumptions are of this empirical strategy. Um, so first, it's, uh, it's the first identifying assumption is that absent tax hikes, smoking trends in tax hike states would be parallel to those in non-tax hike states. Um, and so this is essentially the generalized difference in differences parallel trends assumption. And there's a really nice discussion in this literature review um, about uh, the challenges of uh, looking at this identifying assumption in this uh, setting. So unfortunately, it's difficult to assess for a couple of reasons. Um, so uh, it's challenging to examine first using an event study because there are uh, multiple tax changes in each state. And in, specifically in this study, they're both current and historical. Um, and then also, um, I, in one set of specifications, which I won't show today, I include state-specific linear time trends uh, to attempt to um, account for some of this, but uh, to account for differential uh, state-specific trends over time. Um, however, uh, it might actually be interfering with the identification of effects that accumulate over time. Um, and that's exactly the research question of this paper. So um, this is a bit of a challenge to look at more uh, specifically. Um, I also include, uh, uh, so another identifying assumption is that there are no unaccounted for state level shocks that simultaneously affect cigarette taxes and smoking. And so I'm able to uh, take uh, additional steps here to test for these issues and I'll discuss them in the robustness tests. <laughs> 
And I believe that's the first uh, pause. Great, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dennett. Um, I think we have uh, some quest uh, one question in the Q&A and please audience members feel free to uh, share your questions. Um, there's a question from uh, Norbert uh, Schmidt. What about confounding factors such as switching to alternative nicotine products such as e-cigarettes, sn uh, sniff or snooze? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so my, uh, for e-cigarettes, um, my time sample is uh, limited. So it ends in 2010. So unfortunately, there's no information on e-cigarettes um, at that point. I also believe, I can't remember if the behavioral risk factor surveillance system survey also includes information on um, alternative tobacco products. Um, I don't look at that, but I think that's a really, uh, that would be an important thing to look at um, in future. That's, that's an outcome I'd be really interested in looking at. I'll check if it's in there and run it. <laughs> Great, thank you. And maybe we'll see if um, Mike has any questions or discussants. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, Julia, um, to, for kicking this off. Um, uh, a, few, a few comments, um, and then maybe you can kind of respond to it, and then um, I'll circle back. I think I got one more smaller kind of question. Um, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned that there's uh, recent, recent studies suggest little kind of cigarette uh, tax responsiveness, right? Um, uh, and, you know, I think that that has been shown for, for some populations very recently. Um, you know, obviously, there's there's a big body of work, you know, suggesting that there there have been been um, sizable effects uh, historically, right? Um, uh, and, and so, you know, I kind of wonder if if the story here is kind of like, uh, depending on what decade we're in, basically, like we have different, um, uh, we're on different parts of the demand curve of, of smokers, right? And in more recent years, you might really be on, we might really have hardened smokers, right, that are that are difficult to uh, that that just have very strong preferences for um, for smoking, I guess, right? And and so they're very less likely to be responsive to policy changes like like cigarette uh, uh, taxes recently, right? And so so I kind of wonder like how if if that is the the story, then how do we think about kind of your work here? Um, and and are you kind of measuring? Are you measuring like we're looking at long term effects, right? Are those would those be extrapolatable then to present day, day smokers, maybe if these are really hardened smokers, would we ex expect to see the same long-term effects for this current cohort of smokers compared to historical cohorts of smokers? Or is um, your results pretty much uh, only kind of specific to the types of smokers that have existed in the past and how they were responsive to tobacco policies kind of over their life course? Yeah, so th those are I think I uh, those are great questions. Um, so the answer to the first one, um, which please inter please clarify if I misunderstood, um, but essentially um, that there the analysis um, is there's there's cohort effects kind of going on. So it's it's looking at the effects of these tax interventions on um, on uh, smokers who existed from um, in the '80s and the '90s and the 2000s. Um, and it's it's challenging using my current empirical strategy to kind of disentangle what the cohort effects would be specifically from uh, what the actual effects would be. It's really hard to tell if it was something special about or something specific to that age group versus something specific, which would be like, oh, this is a um, this group was more responsive to cigarette taxes because they're less hardened smokers um, compared to other like more recent uh, age groups, for example. And so, um, unfortunately, I can't really, um, it's unclear to me from this analysis uh, to kind of uh, disentangle uh, cohort effects from uh, age group effects, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great question though, and I'd be really curious to know the answer. Um, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I have another kind of unsatisfying answer for the second part of the question, which is uh, what I expect uh, if we did this again using, or if I did this again using data from the 2010s, um, what would this look like? Um, so. I'm not actually sure. Um, I'd be curious to see because there are more. I know e-cigarettes are a, um, a much bigger, uh, much are uh, smoking e-cigarettes is much higher prevalence now than it, than it was in the past, obviously. Um, and so I, I think I would have to look more carefully at like who, what the composition of these specific um, smokers, of the, of the people who, the adults who are smoking in my sample, what they look like. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, and actually that was uh, something I was going to to uh, to re recommend. Uh, I don't I, maybe we don't. There's not enough data 2010 forward, right? But but I do wonder if you could break apart your data at least into two different samples, um, uh, 1984 through maybe 2000, 2000, 2010, and and kind of. I guess you won't have all the age groups in the most recent set of years, right? Um, but I wonder if at least some of the effects would look similar for the younger age groups um, uh, across both kind of parts of your data that you have, right? Which would then, in that case, it would suggest to me, this is more of a consistent story and isn't specific to that particular point in time, right? Um, so that might be interesting to, to, to try. Um, uh, and I guess, you know, is it, uh, so we're looking at teenage, taxes, right? Um, and, and you might be aware that I have uh, some work that looks specifically at uh, the effect of cigarette taxes when uh, during the, um, uh, the, the uh, when the infant was um, in the gestational period, right, before yes. coming into the world. <laughs> and so is it a fetal origins uh, story? Or is it, you know, a teeny, uh, the effect of the, the tobacco environment during the teenage years, is that's what what drive, drives future behavior? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, so to the first part, um, I think that's a great idea, breaking it up by um, like pre 2000, then 2000, 2010. Um, and so the cutoff here from uh, the cutoff choosing 2010 as a cutoff was actually more just because the they changed the uh, survey design for the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. Um, so 2011, they switched to cell phones and did some, it, it's a phone survey, so they switched to using cell phones and, and did some other um, survey changes. So that was more like of a methodological decision, but I could absolutely pull 2011 to current um, and then also have that as a third sample, looking at it independently. Um, and uh, so I'll definitely uh, be doing that. And then I also wanted to, uh, so the the prenatal um, effects of cigarette taxes, I've that, I'm really interested in uh, that paper, and it's uh, I, that actually was the initial motivation for this study was um, trying to find an instrument to use uh, uh, to look at prenatal smoking. But then I ended up just focusing on the first stage because it was a very interesting. Uh, that ended up being an interesting question, but yeah, it's uh, that's that's a huge uh, translating this into actual health benefits is a great great research area. Yeah. yeah. And um, it's cool how you use this the signer uh, compliance uh, uh, rates, right? Um, I, so I'm no expert on on this program. There might be other people in the audience that know a lot more about uh, this program than um, th uh, than I do. Um, but but with, with just one note of caution, what my understanding is of that program is um, uh, like states basically have kind of incentives to game the systems in order to keep their their grants coming from the federal government, right? And so they mm -hmm. have wide latitude in terms of how they carry out. Uh, the inspections, um, and they might try to carry out the inspections in a certain way to meet certain thresholds, for example, to continue getting state state funding. So just something to be aware of with respect to that program. I think that's one of the recent, more recent years, I think a lot of people, they like using the FDA compliance inspection programs because those are at least carried out by a federal authority, right, in, in a consistent way, right? Um, I, I still think it's an in, interesting part of your paper. I just wanted you to be fully aware of some questions, uh, some limitations of the program, maybe for and uh, how it might be difficult to study. But so that, those are that, that's great. <laughs> my questions, comments at this point. Thanks. That, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll definitely I'll look into using that um, instead. Great. Thank you so much, Mike. I just have a couple of questions or a few questions from our audience. Uh, Don Kenkel has a question about how much do you really need to worry about the change in the post 2010 methodology uh, of the births, given that you include your fixed effects? Yeah, um, so that's a really good point. Um, I did it. It was partially also just out of concern that the specific questions would have been changing um, over time. And it was some pretty big data set anyway at that point. Um, so it was also like a, a, a limitation, I guess, a, a, a computer limitation. Um, but that's a great point. I think what I'm going to do in the future is try to pull all of these years together, including post 2010, so I can look at some of these other questions, great questions that have been coming up and then kind of separate it into three periods. Sounds like a good way to um, actually take a look at, look at this. So yeah, thank you for that question. Great, uh, one more from Ken Warner. Uh, concerning your first assumption, are you concerned that taxation may be in part endogenous, the result of states in which smoking is less uh, favored, uh, 
prevalence slower and possibly declining faster. Does that challenge the assumed parallel trends, uh, parallel trend pattern in tax hike and non-tax hike states? Yeah, absolutely. So that's something I actually talk about during the robustness test is, uh, is concerns with policy endogeneity. And um, just to like briefly preview what I do. Um, so I end up doing a couple of robustness tests um, to try to account for some of that. Um, one of one age groups appears to be affected, but otherwise the results appear to be somewhat robust, uh, mostly robust to that um, to that concern. But yeah, that's absolutely something I look at and is a, is a real concern. Here. Great, thanks. And just a very quick uh, clarifying question. Could you, uh, Cass Adams asks, can you please say again, approximately how many thousand early deaths could be prevented from cigarette tax increases? Or if you're gonna to return to that soon, totally fine to um, return to that. Yeah, so it's, um, I, I don't get, get into the really, uh, just for time concern, uh, constraints, I don't really get into the nitty gritty details of it, but it's about, I, I, the, it's like a back of the envelope type simulation. I come up with 40 to 70,000. Great, thank you so much. I think we're clear now, please, please continue. Great. Perfect. Um, so just to quickly recap uh, where we're at. Um, so um, I'm going to look at the effects of current and past state cigarette tax hikes on adult smoking outcomes. And so uh, just to show the results, uh, first, I'm gonna look at the effects of current and early life taxes on ever having smoked, which is an extensive margin outcome. And so um, just a quick note on how to uh, interpret these tables, because they are a lot um, on first, first glance. So each column uh, is a regression that includes both the current tax and then an earlier ta uh, the tax at an earlier um, age. And the coefficients can be interpreted as the impact of a $1 increase in, in real 1982 dollars on the probability of ever having smoked. Um, and so, as you can see from this table, um, kind of consistent with, uh, with some of the uh, uh, research that's coming up, uh, is that there seems to be a limited effect of uh, current taxes on this outcome for all age groups. Oh, I'm sorry, this isn't consistent. This actually makes sense. Um, that's the next slide. This, this, uh, so there's a limited effect on, for this outcome for all age groups. And this actually just makes sense because um, we don't think that the current cigarette tax uh, should be impacting past past smoking decisions unless you have a time machine. So, um, so this, this results uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, however, you can see that past cigarette taxes, um, including both teenage and um, uh, uh, adult tax hikes, appear to have decreased the long-term probabilities of ever having smoked. So for example, um, the age 17 cigarette tax hike uh, decreases the probability of ever having smoked uh, by about 5.4 percentage points for adults age 25 to 34. Um, the age 30 cigarette tax hike de decreases the probability of ever having smoked from, uh, by, uh, for adults age 35 to 44 uh, by about, about 5.4 percentage points. And the age 40 cigarette tax decreases the probability of ever having smoked um, for adults aged 45 to 54 by about 6.4 uh, percentage points and then another um, effect for the age 50 cigarette tax. And so these effects really appear to persist um, across adulthood, even though sometimes the standard errors get bigger, um, you can see that, there's, that there seems to be kind of a consistent um, long-term impact here. And so this is consistent with the idea uh, that tax hikes that occur earlier in life actually uh, prevent long-term initiation. And so next, um, looking at another extensive margin outcome, uh, current smoking participation. So first, you can see that um, consistent with uh, some prior research, uh, the current taxes have a very small effect on current smoking, with one exception being this 45 to 54-year-old age group, which I'll talk about um, more in a moment. Um, so as you can see, there, all, the effect appears to be negative, but there's very large standard errors. Um, so uh, you don't really see uh, an effect of the current cigarette tax hike on, uh, on smoking participation. However, you do see a consistent uh, pattern of decreased long-term smoking um, from past tax hikes. So first, looking at, uh, age seven, at uh, teenage cigarette tax hikes, you can see that um, uh, a $1 increase decreases the probability of current smoking participation by about 6.7 percentage points. And that this um, appears to persist um, 
through young adulthood, but then may start to dissipate with age. Um, and so the effect size attenuates um, and the standard errors increase over time. Um, how, and there's also a similar pattern for um, taxes at older ages. So just as the first example at age 30, a $1 increase, or one third, a $1 increase at age 30 decreases the probability of uh, current smoking by about uh, three percentage points for 35 to 44 year, 35 to 44 year olds. Um, but then here you'll notice the pattern shifts and it appears that the current cigarette tax um, actually is uh, decreasing uh, smoking amongst this age group. And so it could be, um, as uh, Mike, uh, Mike brought up earlier, that this could just be um, this just a cohort effect just from when this was actually happening. Um, this group was is less likely to be a uh, a uh, th th this group was more responsive more this specific age group was more responsive to cigarette taxes for some reason. Um, also, though, I just want to note that in the robustness tests that include controls for policy endogeneity, this result actually um, attenuates completely. And so it's this is kind of the result that it's not clear uh, that there might actually be some policy endogeneity issues with this specific age group. Um, so I just wanted to note that, but uh, nonetheless, um, it doesn't affect the long term patterns that appear again for the 55 to 64 year olds. Uh, so a $1 increase in the age 40 cigarette tax decreases the probability of uh, current smoking amongst 55 to 64 year olds by about 8.6 percentage points. And the a $1 increase in the age 50 cigarette tax decreases the probability of current smoking by about 3.5 percentage points. Um, and so finally, um, I'm going to look at the uh, third outcome, which is an intensive margin outcome. And uh, this is what just to remind, uh, remind everybody, this is defined as the average number of cigarettes smoked each day, conditional on current smoking. And so this sample only includes current adult smokers. So as a result, this may actually reflect um, a compositional change that occurs. So um, at uh, people who uh, previously quit smoking, uh, this might leave a very selected group behind. So it wouldn't be you know, out of the question to imagine that uh, this group, it might actually make it look like in response to a cigarette tax that this group smokes more. Um, so I just wanted to note the potential for a compositional change here. Um, but despite this concern, um, it looks like the primary driver of smoking intensity um, is the current tax. This is consistent across the age distribution. And the magnitude is roughly that a $1 increase in the cigarette tax uh, decreases uh, smoking, uh, decreases uh, the intensity of smoking by about two to four uh, cigarettes each day, depending on what uh, age group you're looking at. And past taxes may also play a role here, but the pattern is less obvious. Um, and I also just wanted to note, um, it looks like also that smoke-free laws um, also play a role for this age 45 to 54 um, year old group, the current what smoke-free laws. Um, however, this I'm still exploring kind of the concerns with policy endogeneity um, for this specific age group, but I just wanted to note that as something of interest. Um, and then I also wanted to show um, some subsample results I thought this audience would find interesting. Um, so I look specifically at the effects of cigarette taxes um, and other policy interventions that uh, people experience specifically as a teenager on young adult smoking. So young adults are the only group that, um, in my sample, are the only group that actually experienced uh, the SINAR regulation changes and the introduction of smoke-free laws at the age of 17. Um, and so um, I thought it would be interesting to look at them. And so I find, first of all, not surprisingly, that the age 17 cigarette tax uh, decreases the extensive margin outcomes similar to before. However, it also looks like the SINAR compliance rate at age 17 um, decreases the young adult smoking. And so the uh, magnitude of these findings, uh, so if you go from zero to 100% compliance, it decreases the probability of a young adult ever having smoked by 4.5 percentage points and the probability of current smoking by three percentage points. Um, and I also include a uh, smoking intensity here for completeness, uh, but there is much less variation available here in the uh, non-tax policy, um, the non-tax policy uh, interventions. And so I just wanted to note that um, just in case to take those results with a grain of salt. 
And so uh, finally, so just to summarize my results overall again, before I start discussing uh, the robustness tests, um, I find that cigarette tax hikes uh, um, experienced over the life course prevent smoking initiation, reduce short run smoking intensity and lead to quitting over time. However, um, I wanna discuss some of these, the tests I've done um, or I'm thinking of doing in order to assess the robustness of these findings. So the first, and this came up um, as a question, um, tobacco policy may be endogenous to other factors that affect smoking behaviors. So for example, um, cigarette tax revenue um, gained from these tax hikes could be immediately invested into other health interventions that decrease smoking prevalence. Policy shifts could also be endogenous to other changing factors within a state. So for example, um, like a decline in uh, smoking could be due to anti-smoking attitudes that simultaneously um, increase the popularity of passing cigarette taxes. Um, and so the way I, uh, I, the robustness tests I do here um, is I include controls for health-related personal transfer receipts uh, from the state. And then I also include lag demand for cigarettes um, in the analysis. And this is measured as, the per, ca as per capita cigarette sales. Um, and so I generally find there's, uh, that my results are robust to look, including both of these um, variables. Um, with the exception being that 45 to 54 year old age group that I mentioned. Um, but otherwise the, the results are robust from these, um, from including these variables in the regressions. Um, and so another potential limitation of this um, research is that um, I have to assume there's no migration since the past state of residence is not available in the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. Um, and so this could generate measurement errors uh, that um, I would argue would likely understate effects since migration is negatively correlated with smoking. Um, however, one way I, I, can, I try to uh, tease this apart is I conduct a subgroup analysis um, looking at respondents with high school completion or less educational attainment. And the logic here is that uh, migration rates increase with education. And so by focusing on this group, um, I can see if there is a, uh, I, can, I can see if there's a larger effect that might be attributable to measurement error. And that is indeed what I find. I find a larger effect size um, for this group. And so it's consistent with measurement error, but it's also consistent with um, heterogeneous effects for this uh, population. So I'm working to test this um, in other ways using other data sources. Um, another concern is that there could be strategic responses to policy changes. Um, so uh, uh, it came up, people mentioned, uh, a question came up saying that they, uh, there could be like changes to other types of tobacco or uh, switching to lower quality cigarettes. And also cross-border shopping is a potential issue here. So I, uh, over this sample, I'm, I, uh, I think the extensive margin outcomes are likely to be unaffected by things by, you know, switching to switching cigarette brands. Um, and uh, looking at geographic boundaries as st the states are geographic boundaries here. So that might hopefully minimize the issue. Um, but I'm still exploring the uh, looking at further ways to explore these questions. Um, for the latter, I'm actually uh, hoping to look at state groups with very tight borders and different tax rates. So like New England might be a good subsample to look at here. Um, and then finally, um, there's been some recent methods work looking at these two-way fixed effect models. Um, so the differential timing of tax changes may bias estimates in this setting um, if, if there's heterogeneous treatment effects. And so the adjustments I can do for that are further complicated because the treatment here is, uh, is continuous. It's a non-binary treatment. Um, so there's been some other, um, there's been some recent methods work though that um, I'm still reading into that might help uh, kind of explore these issues further. I think that's the second break. Apologies, I had a bit of trouble with my, uh, with my computer. Um, we, we have, uh, Meg, Meg, maybe we'll see if you have a couple of questions and then we'll give the audience members some time to, uh, but there are questions in the Q and A. Yeah, um, I guess my my first question is: um, uh, Do um, uh, by not if researchers don't include uh, some of these historical uh, cigarette taxes in their model, is that constituting a source of bias then for the current tax 
uh, uh, estimates or do are those unchanged uh, regardless of if you include these historical taxes in the model or, or not? Um, so for my results, um, it, it was, so I, I looked at it, I, I looked at these separately, like looked, I looked at just the effects of the current cigarette taxes. Mm -hmm. And then I also looked at it with both. I don't present those results. Um, and then I also include the historical taxes and I don't find um, the effects were that affected that the current, the estimates on the current tax were affected. The one group where that is not true is the young adult group. So often it looked like the, the, um, the current cigarette tax could have been affecting um, smoking for that group. But I think that I kind of uh, consider that to be more of like a mechanical correlation between looking at an age 17 cigarette tax and then looking at like an age 20 cigarette tax. Um, okay. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I would I would just recommend you make that point quite clear in in, in the paper, just because you wouldn't want people to take away, mm -hmm. um, you know, a message that all of these other tax studies that have been controlled for historical taxes, they're uh, biased, right? Oh, um, yeah, absolutely uh, not. Because yeah. because you, you find that that not to be the um, the case, which is which is reassuring. Um, uh, so it is a little bit, uh, one kind of odd result that um, that uh, struck me was um, how the um, the cigarette tax rate uh, at like ages 40 and 50, um, how that affects uh, ever use among the older cohorts of adults, right? Um, I mean, we, you know, most initiation should, be ha uh, should happen in, um, uh, in uh, maybe in teenage years or maybe some people initiate between age 18 to 24, but it's kind of odd how like in the uh, age 45 to 54, how, you know, the, the tax at age 40 has an effect. What I think is going on is I think that there's, um, you know, some correlation probably between or some leg defect of the age 17 cigarette tax rate still might be, if it's high at age 17, it still might be high in that state at, you know, age 40. So maybe it's, it's reflecting um, some delayed effect of these taxes that people experienced when they were actually making decisions about initiation or, or, or not. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, I was, I was, when I first saw these results too, I spent some time trying to figure out what could be going um, on here. And I think that, I think what you suggest is probably mm -hmm. the, the best explanation um, about it. It's just that a state that has high taxes when you're 17 is also probably a state that has yeah. high taxes when you're 40. And so that result mm -hmm. is just continuing to show up. Yeah. And um, one, one idea then would be to just include all of the, the leg taxes in the model at the same time. Right. Um, yeah. uh, I think then uh, maybe then it would uh, you might see the more clear effect of that that tax during the teenage years. And, and you might not see the effect on ever smoking of some of these later life taxes, which is what I would expect on this measure. On the current use measure, of course, uh, taxes at any age um, might affect current smoking. Right. But but you can't. Right. You know, once you're in, once you're a, a lifetime smoker, you can't not be a lifetime smoker um, uh, any longer. Right. So, um, <laughs> uh, okay, great. And um, uh, let's see. Uh, and I guess I, I I was I liked what you did with the the migration. I think that those are really reasonable um, uh, uh, specification checks, uh, focusing just on the the high school educated, for example, who might be you know, less likely to uh, relocate across state lines, also more likely to smoke, like you said. Um, uh, I, I did kind of wonder if there is data out there on, um, uh, you, you know, from census or otherwise on kind of what percent of uh, a state's population in a certain decade moves to another state, if, if there's any kind of relocation data like that, that could somehow be brought into your model. Yeah, absolutely. So what I'm currying, um, so I, I, I received this comment from another, um, from a reviewer at some point. Um, and so they recommended actually using the American Community Survey, um, which has explicitly like state of birth available. Um, and so I, that's hopefully what I'm going to be doing is using um, to actually kind of measure, um, to, to, to try to see what the, uh, try to have a better sense of who's migrating um, mm -hmm. and the, how that might actually be affecting um, the sample that I'm looking at. Okay. Those yeah, are my comments absolutely. at this, this point. So great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and now we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, Young Me has a really helpful comment that was actually in the back of my mind. Um, uh, they point out that there's a working paper you might want to have a look at if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, differences and differences with a continuous treatment by Calloway, uh, Santana, and Goodman Bacon. I think, I mean, perhaps you've seen that paper. I think, um, you know, I too work in the space of continuous treatment, so this falls on me as well. But um, my sense is that 
uh, these authors are suggesting that two way fixed effects with the continuous treatment are uh, perhaps the picture is less rosy than the binary treatments, and we're just going to have to make stronger assumptions. But th this paper is um, super helpful if you, if you have not seen it yet. Yeah, so I'm really glad um, that this was posted. So I actually, um, I as I was revising slides for the seminar, um, I uh, I actually I found that paper in the process of it. So I'm still reading through it, but I was really impressed. Like I'm very excited to hopefully use those methods in this setting. Yeah, thank thank you for uh, posting that paper. Great, thanks. Uh, and James Pricker has a question um, on your instruments lag demand uh, plus auto correlation in the error structure. Uh, may lead to invalid instruments, it would seem. Did you explore whether the necessary lack of serial correlation uh, in the errors hold? Uh, maybe maybe speaking to that in context of what you're doing? Yeah, um, so I actually haven't checked that, but that's been on my, um, something that I've been very um, curious in because it, or I think that's a very important point because that is the, Obviously, there's going to be uh, a correlation between demand for cigarettes within a state, but also like whether or not people are, you know, are actually participating in smoking. Um, so that's a really great point. I haven't checked it yet, but that's absolutely something um, that I will be doing. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, and then there's a comment from Skip Murray just speaking a bit about the SINAR. Um, uh, program uh, that this requires states pass at least 80% of compliance checks to receive funding. Uh, she, this person is in um, Minnesota. Uh, not all businesses are checked annually for, for SINAR compliance, uh, which are checks outside of the ones done to comply with state regulations for one check per year. Um, the FDA compliance checks are also not done on every businesses uh, or even every businesses when they come to town. Uh, perhaps maybe just some additional details um, on, on the uh, sign our program that may, may be helpful. That's great. Um, yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Super. And just one more question, um, a question from Raj Janay. Um, what impact will be on smoking trend during inflation and with cessation education to youth? Um, yeah, so that's um, a good question. I'm not... Um, I'm not actually sure. Um, so I, I think like that, like uh, including kind of those sorts of policy interventions are potentially important. I couldn't find a good source of data um, to look at other ones. And so if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I think that's a great, those are other policy interventions though that need to be looked at um, as well. Great, uh, just one quick question here from Si Shang. Um, she asks, and perhaps I've just missed you, missed you answering this. Um, have you checked collinear, uh, the collinearity between current taxes and other tax measures? So I think that's kind of, uh, maybe related to the some of the questions we've heard. Right. Um, so I have. So um, I looked at. Uh, so I actually have this cleaned. I have. I have um, alcohol beer taxes very specifically um, cleaned for that cleaned as well. And so those were actually um, not that collinear, but I haven't looked at it with regards to other um, taxes. Great. Thanks so um, much uh, for the great answers, and uh, please continue. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me get back to. Okay, I think we were here. Um, so uh, next I'm gonna be looking at the policy implications of my findings. Um, and so to kind of further investigate this, um, I'm gonna simulate the long-term effects of a hypothetical current tax increase of about $1.25 and translate that into long-term effects for mort uh, on mortality. And so $1.25 was chosen because it's 41 cents in 1982 dollars, which is roughly um, what the average state tax increase was um, in the 2000s. And so this is like, this is representative of like that very large tax uh, gain we saw at uh, average for the nation between 2001 and 2011. And so what I'm going to do to, um, to undertake this is uh, calculate the differential impacts of lag taxes a ta lagged tax increases at different ages on smoking outcomes 10 years later. And so more specifically, I do this in two steps. Um, first, I use data from the 2018 IPUM's National Health Interview Survey um, to represent current smoking in the US population. And so um, current smoking behavior. So I look at all of my outcomes and um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I separate this by age groups. So it's each of the different age groups that correspond to my analytic sample. And then I uh, project the smoking behaviors of each age group forward 10 years by applying the statistically significant estimates of my main findings. 
And so what I end up with, with um, is that it uh, uh, is effects that represent changes in smoking behaviors due to a 2018 tax hike for each age group in 2028. So just to show the results here. So I find um, in 10 years, uh, it decreased uh, that a $1.25 tax hike decreases the probability of ever smoking by 2.1 percentage points, uh, current smoking by 1.2 percentage points, and smoking intensity by two cigarettes a day. Um, and so just to show what this looks, an example, um, so this is for the percent current smokers outcome. Um, and you can see that, um, uh, I, I weight this by population, so you can see what the effect would be for each age group roughly. Um, but uh, this aggregate 1.2 percentage point difference is then what I use uh, to do a back of the envelope calculation um, to translate this into mortality improvements. Um, and I do this using risk charts of death from smoking related uh, causes over the next 10 years. And so what I find is that this decline uh, translates to around 43,000 to 69,000 or 40 to 70, I think I uh, put uh, fewer deaths from smoking by 2038. And so um, just to conclude, um, in this study, I evaluate the effects of exposure to cigarette taxes over the life course on long-term smoking in the United States. Overall, I find that cigarette tax hikes prevent long-term smoking initiation, cause adults who smoke uh, to smoke fewer cigarettes in the near term, and then over the long run, um, actually lead to quitting over time. And so uh, the policy implications of my findings, um, the first is that although cigarette tax hikes uh, appear to have a limited effect on, the, on current smoking, they might be having a large impact on long-term smoking. Um, so it's, it's uh, suggestive here that not necessary to not necessarily write off tax, cigarette tax hikes as a policy intervention to reduce smoking. Um, and so um, it, uh, and my results suggest that it might take roughly a decade for these effects to accumulate. Um, and then kind of a second policy and implication here is that anti-smoking interventions should target older age groups in addition to teenagers and young people. Um, and, uh, state cigarette excise taxes may be particularly important in this context since a tax hike uh, effect will end up affecting all ages as opposed to um, youth access restrictions or some of the other uh, tobacco 21 uh, laws that we've seen recently. And it's also important because there are substantial mortality and morbidity benefits from quitting smoking um, even at older ages. So adults who previously smoked but quit in their 60s um, still experience large reductions in mortality after the age of 40, after the age of 70, um, compared to individu individuals who continued to smoke. And people who quit smoking reduce the risks of heart attack within one year, stroke within two to five years, um, oral and throat cancers within five years, and lung cancer within 10 years. And so um, that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much for the, the really great talk. Uh, Mike, do you have any uh, any questions at this point? Yeah, just just one. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much for the presentation. Uh, I think this is really uh, exciting uh, uh, work. Um, uh, I thought that your kind of takeaway point that it may take a decade to um, for the effects to accumulate, um, it kind of made me think of uh, there might be an ability to, to do kind of a back of the envelope um, we know that generally it takes people multiple quit attempts before they are successful. So I wonder if, you know, maybe what we're observing is we see people um, when these tax hikes happen, you know, they, they start the effort to try to, to quit. Um, uh, but it, you know, they're only successful, you know, many years later uh, due to, you know, failures in, in being able to. Um, so I just wondered if there might be a way to kind of take knowing success rates in quitting smoking and, and knowing um, information about how many quit attempts people make in a year uh, to try to see if that matches up with um, the decade uh, that that uh, estimate that you provide with your work. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, so I, I think that's a very good story as to what might be going on is that it's not just like, you know, an increase in tax rates and then people immediately respond. Um, it's that it's actually just this kind of, uh, it's repeatedly going to buy more expensive cigarettes um, versus kind of um, like a, maybe an addiction capital uh, type uh, mm -hmm. uh, type idea that's being built up. And so that would be a great um, just to actually 
actually see um, what quit attempts look like um, and how that corresponds to these results. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, we just have one question in uh, the Q&A. So audience members, please do feel free to add your questions. Uh, we have a comment, a question from Norbert Schmidt. Uh, can you uh, differentiate the tax impact on the smoking status of multiple socioeconomic groups? Um, so that is absolutely something that uh, could be done with this data. Um, I don't do I don't do any um, heterogeneous effects um, by socio demographic groups in my in this analysis. That's absolutely something um, I'll I can consider doing in the future because um, there's a rich set of demographic variables available in this data set. So. That's a great idea. Great, uh, and just one one question for me, and just uh, as, as you've been speaking, I know you mentioned earlier in response to your question that there are challenges in this type of analysis where you are trying to differentiate sort of age effects from cohort effects. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought perhaps of, and this would require getting more data, which is always kind of a pain, but um, there are cohorts out there, like for example, uh, NLSY 97, or sorry, 79 and, and 97 as well, where you could at least look at smoking at different ages within that same cohort, which might um, allow for some suggestive evidence um, on speaking to that differentiation between cohort and age effects. Yeah, actually, that's that's really that's a really helpful idea because um, I think that's an important that's important for policy implications too. Um, just to see if if the current just to actually differentiate, um, as Mike was saying, if if the current cigarette tax, if the limited effects are due to um, kind of the current the current environment of uh, of the current composition of smokers, or if it's like um, you know a, a cohort effect. So that that's absolutely real. That's a great idea. I'll look into doing that. Thanks so much. Uh, I think we have uh, cleared the Q&A. So thanks for the great answers and the great talk. Thank you. Th and thank you ever so much for all the really helpful uh, comments and questions everybody's um, been uh, asking. It was very exciting to be here today. So thank you again. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of 120 people for your participation. Have a top-snotch weekend. <laughs>